<laughs> Who's Johnny Bench? <laughs> he's on his way in. He's finishing up his uh, interview before us. Johnny Bench. Yeah. You know, Jim. I'm gonna do this like my, my, my hand, like 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 I'm waiting for the ball to get thrown. Uh, uh, there he is. There many he is. people. Catcher extraordinaire. You, we should close the curtain, by the way, so we get good video. We don't want people walking by. Many people consider him to be <laughs> the greatest catcher of all time. Did um, you know that? Yeah. That's right. <clears throat> I've heard that. He played for a little team called the Cincinnati Reds. Well, oh, they were big. From 1967. To 1983. Yeah, allegedly. Okay. Two-time World Series champion. Yeah, whatever. Big deal. MVP in 76, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you say. And there he is, Johnny Bench. Hello, everybody. Hello. Is How are you? How are you doing? Nice to Pleasure. See you. How are you? Welcome. Thank you. Very, thanks for having me. This thanks is, for coming in. This is good. This is good. Welcome. We this are live. Is the morning or the afternoon? This is the morning still. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, technically. How are you doing? I'm doing great. We're having a great time being able to talk about our uh, the Smithfield School app. And yeah, how did you get involved in the with the with the Smithfield School app? Well, I've been involved with apps uh, in the past, and we've sort of studied between cities and all the things that go along with it. But more importantly, I have young children. Mm -hmm. I have boys that are seven and ten, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, little things at school sort of pop up. You know, that, that bully in the you know in kindergarten and preschool, and it was like we started investigating a little bit more and finding out that this was a possibility. And so we uh, found the developer to, to provide all of the information that, that each app would provide. Mm -hmm. And we've developed this app, that, and we started talking to Smithfield about it. And they said, we want to be a part of this because suicide is the third leading cause of death for teens. And a lot of it's because they're being cyberbullied and a lot of the social media, the way we have it today. These kids are going home and they're getting bullied over those texts or emails or whatever. It never stops. Where you at? What were when we were growing up? You could walk away from school, and at least kind of collect your brain. Possibly, it's now never ending. Did you ever have a fight right. after school? Me? I did. Yeah. My own sexuality. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Still working on that. I, I see. certainly yeah, am, Johnny. Great, I yeah. certainly am. <laughs> He's, well, what do you do? He's we got a lot it. of questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you live with it. You know, you're yeah. honest. And that's great. That's my last fight, I think, was probably after school. Maybe, you know, fifth grade, the tension leading up to it. It was like yeah. that movie, Three O'Clock oh, High. It. It's yeah, awful. scared to death and everything yeah. else. I got, I got thumped a couple of times and a couple of guys after me and everything else, and it wasn't very good, and I stood up to them, but... You know, back in those days, you could. Well, with this app, we're, uh, all the schools will be able to have their phone platform. They'll be able to design it. They'll be able to, the way they want to, they can uh, fix it up. You can go into the, and then all users, whether it be the parents, students, alumni, can download it into their phones, into their uh, mobile device. They'll be able to get calendars, uh, schedules, events, uh, scores. You can get push notifications. You can be alerted to any kind of situation that we are on lockdown, all kids are safe, so the parents know exactly that everybody's all right. Mm -hmm. They can be alerted to uh, closures, school closures. Were your kids getting bullied and then you was like, we got to do something? Like, well, what made you want to do this? What was happening? That was the reason and part of it. But I think it's more importantly is that that's all you hear about is kids getting cyberbullied. When you started talking about the, the number of suicides. And a lot of it were blamed on the cyberbullying. Then, then I had a real problem with it. So, when talking to Smithfield, we developed the app. Now it's called, and you can go to SmithfieldSchoolApp.com and sign up. If you're a school all over the country, it's available. How happy? Oh, go ahead. Were you a good fighter when you were a kid, or no? No. You, I'm looking at your hands. You're obviously a great uh, athlete, but your hands are. Uh, Johnny oh Bench God. has massive hands. Like you, I really you don't know. Not... I, I was only known for holding seven baseballs <laughs> one time. In <laughs> oh, my, oh, you were known. For, yeah, okay. yeah, that's what you got to be known. Uh, for. Am I just noticing something that everybody else noticed in yeah. 1971? <laughs> All right, I'm an asshole. Sorry. Well, they're still big. <laughs> is the thing. <laughs> no, I was small. I was like five two in the eighth grade, and I'd gotten in school a year early, and I grew about nine inches in the next two years. But there were a couple of kids that pushed me around a little bit, and they tried to do it, and I busted one in the mouth, and I got uh, went to the principal's office and got a board used on me, but it was worth it. Yeah. How much of it do you think is that people are bullying more now and it's constant, and how much of it is it the way that kids don't fight back anymore? Well, you can't fight back, and it's almost scary what they fight back with because now they bring their weapons to school. It's no longer when uh, Gilbert pulled a knife on me at school in the fifth grade. That was kind of dangerous as well. But now kids, in order to retaliate, to get even, they come out with the big weapons. And so I think that this is just something, but it's just cutesy little kids. It's, it's little yeah. teenage girls that are doing it, or somebody's jealous of the fact that he thinks she thinks you're cute. So he's, she's, this hair boyfriend now is going to go after you. 
and start creating rumors about you and saying things about you that are totally unkind, totally untrue, and they only, and no matter what you say, you can't change it. You can't, as much, much as you deny, 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 people still believe it. And then you start to feel it. And then you start to withdraw. And then your school work suffers. The fact that your own personality and your health uh, suffers. So if I can, if, if this app will help, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50% or eliminate a lot of the cyberbullying, then we've really done our job. So you're into this app very much. Now, it's been a long time since you retired. What did you do in the time since you retired to now? Like you, you got this, and you're really happy with doing that. Were there other things that you were doing that were kind of similar to this? Well, I, I'm, I do a lot of motivational speaking. I talk about the vowels of success, the A-E-I-O-U's of life, and I wrote a book called Catch Every Ball, How to Handle Life's Pitches, because yeah. everything in life, even your producer is a, is a, is a great catcher because – Everything Not a good producer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, there went that one out the window. See, that's bullying. That is bullying. That's what we have to match up to. No, that's truth telling. But I've also, I have a scholarship fund. I, I didn't get to go to college. I started baseball when I was 17, and I didn't get to go to college. I have a scholarship fund with 84 kids on scholarship. So I've always thought about education and what it means. So I stay busy with that, and then I've got a 26-year-old. Uh, he went to Boston University, and I've got sons that are uh, 7 and 10. So I'm, I'm busy. How much different is it raising young kids now yeah. than it was i guess the 26 year old though because sure. you didn't have to raise you wouldn't have had to raise any kids when you were at the peak of your baseball no, career no, at all. no i've never i never really had to and i you know he was born after my induction so yeah so he's really you know he knows of me and about me and these and my the younger ones now they you know they hear it from everybody else or parents. do they or understand who you are we right. asked dr jay that <laughs> once like do they understand the magnitude of who you are you know i've never showed them really a video or anything else but I've, a couple of times in the plane a couple three or four years ago when they were really young we'd be standing there waiting to get off the plane and they'd say this is my dad he's in the hall of fame and it was like uh <laughs> where did you come up with that and, and they know it and i don't it's i'm just dad you know i i don't want to be you know much more than that but at the same time i want them to grow up to love the game to love sports and participate and uh the one J justin he had like 14 home runs when he was eight years old then he got hit by a pitch and then he got hit by a throw and he's sort of like a little gun gun shy, shy right yeah. uh -huh. so uh, he's a soccer player right now and, I, and the other one's uh I think he's going to develop a microchip and be player Sat owner. Oh, I want him to be owner of the team. And then if he wants to play, he can put himself in. <laughs> <laughs> Just figure out where the money is first. That's all. It's changed <laughs> a lot. Too. The, the salaries are so much bigger. Do you guys who retired a long time ago look at that and go, like, God damn it, I just missed that by 10 or 15 no, years? No, not at all. I mean, I made $2 million in my entire career. What would I do with three or $400 million? Are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're mighty God mighty. I'm, I'm, I would be flying in here on my own for the uh, Gulf Stream, and I'm saying, hey, I don't need you, all right? Did you I'm make two million your whole career? That was what, about what it came 2. to? 2.2, yeah. Wow. wow. I made 11000 my first year. As a rookie, and I was MVP. I was. Who'd you work for, Sirius XM? <laughs> <laughs> I was rookie of the year. I made a twenty. I was MVP and made forty. I was MVP again and made eighty. Shouldn't there be some kind of thing where it's like if people are going around still to this day? referring to you as the greatest catcher that ever lived. There should be some kind of payment plan for that, right? I've if you're one of the, the greatest. Commissioner. I've talked to the commissioner. <laughs> you brought and, it up? <laughs> and I don't get I don't get upgraded. I don't get to what? I don't get to move to the first of the front of the line at the movie theaters. What? I mean, I it just doesn't seem fair at all. You're absolutely right. Can we start a campaign? There that may be, be my next app. Yeah, get that's Johnny up front. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What was it like in that time period? Uh because you know, not only were you known as this legendary guy the team it was a legendary team yeah but to share it with a guy like pete rose who was so like gloriously outspoken and obviously well, we kind like of the, that. the we rock like star that. you know because joe and, and joe and i and tony i mean we could sit back and let him you know talk to the press he was great for us you he didn't was, like talking to the press necessarily. i didn't mind it yeah. i didn't mind it they, they were delving into it and it started sort of transferring over when you know we had news reporters that were looking for a story rather than the game. Right. And then it became all of a sudden, you know, guys were afraid to talk to certain guys because you weren't sure what they were going to write. I mean, you know, a critic is a legless man who teaches running. <laughs> so this is a situation <laughs> where, you know, we can go through all of this and everything else. But, 
you know, when you go to work every day with the best players in the world and one of the greatest teams in the world, it was just beyond belief. And, and we were fortunate because we did have that kind of team that still people today respect and admire. Are you protective of your legacy? Like, do you watch now if somebody's talking about, like, say, a new catcher? Do you watch oh, them no, wanting no, no. to make I sure that it. they're not? I love it. I, I just, you know, they're talking about Sanchez now because he started off so well and everything else. And I always say, let's wait six or seven years mm -hmm. because there's so many variables. Guys get hurt. Their knees go down. We had Joe Maurer from the, the, the Twins. Unbelievable. Won the batting title, and then his legs stopped. And, you know, he just lost his legs, and now he's the first baseman. So I think anytime you talk about catching, we've got a, a Johnny Bench Award, which is a college catcher of the year. And we've got like 13 of those kids that have been nominated and won the award or, or been a part of the final three contest, and, and they're in the major leagues. Like Weeders today, you know, uh, he, was, he was one of our guys. We got Posey, we got Zanino, we got Suzuki, we got Clements, Ionetta, uh, the Castro kid. So I'm, I'm constantly watching all the box scores to see how the, the guys are doing. Who has the best arm you ever saw? I'm going to guess uh, Ivan Rodriguez. <laughs> That's yeah. That's hard to beat. That uh, there was uh, uh, a couple of guys. There's always been great catchers, but if they unless they won the MVP or the Rookie of the or a batting title or home run title, we really don't pay much attention to them. But I mean, I love uh, Salvador Perez. I just think he's phenomenal. Who's right he? Now. I know he is, but Sam doesn't. He's the catcher for the Kansas City Royals. Yeah, I told and, you. That's and, right. I mean, he is just. <laughs> He's just phenomenal. See, There's a lot of them out there. We just they're just not you know making it happen. You follow baseball just as closely as you ever have to this day. Yeah. Is yeah. that just because you just the love of the game has totally. never gone away for you? Totally. Was there even when you left, there wasn't a period of like let me get baseball out of my life. There was never sort of a bitter whatever. No, oh. I, I retired because I knew I couldn't be Johnny Bench anymore. Right. I couldn't play at a level and I was taking money from the team that I that I didn't earn and so uh, you know, I'm watching these guys and I'm doing this stuff and everything else but I was always still involved. I was always wanting this guy or that guy, you had favorites, you had people that you'd been associated with, you knew, and your favorites became some kind of association, whether they were part of the award or whether they were just great players like Mike Trout or, you know, somebody that you really wanted to watch or Stanton or, you know, and they're all down like Arenado. I mean, you can go down and say all these players are unbelievable. And I and I love watching people that are, that are committed to the game and love the game and play the game as hard as they can. How do players treat you? I mean, it's got to be guys who retire, like who aren't Johnny Bench or who aren't Pete Rose. Like players don't really see them as royalty. It's got to be nice to at least be in a position where whenever you go back, you're still the guy in the room that everybody wants well, to talk to. Well, you know, they they know the name obviously, but there's a lot of these young guys that have really don't have a sense of history. They don't under, know really. The yeah, there's it's just. You know, they wouldn't know if you mentioned a couple of players and you know that are in the Hall of Fame, but they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't know much at all about. So you them. had that where you met a couple of people and they're like, "This is Johnny Bench," and they're like, "Hey," and you're like, "What the fuck is that?" <laughs> hey. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I won't name any names, but it was kind of like, "Yeah, okay, this is good," and it's like, "Okay, fine, I, that didn't matter." I mean, I, I still whatever they are, they are, and but that's just part of the history, and a lot of them, you know. A lot of kids, 40, 30, 39, 40 percent of baseball now is Latin. So, mm -hmm. I mean, they're not always familiar and they don't always get the TV and they don't get the newspapers and they don't get the updates of what's going on in, in baseball. So all they ever wanted to do was play baseball. They were committed. They, they grew up. They practiced. They signed. They come through the minor leagues and they're in the major leagues and all of a sudden they're not really aware except of some of the history of the Dominican or the Venezuelan or any Cuban guys that have played before them. Now, they're involved with that, but not with the, the former players. I still don't know how you don't know who Johnny Bench is. I don't yeah. understand that. Even if, you, even if you don't like baseball, how do you not know that name? How on earth do you... Like, when people pick up on the fact that you're doing something historic as you're playing. Thanks. Not you. Oh. <laughs> right. that, Sorry, that you're, you're looking this way. <laughs> that you're do, no, I wasn't looking at you. Right. That you're doing something historic like you were doing. Like, you became... A legend as you were playing and whether it's the the fan support or the women that are have had to have been throwing themselves at you I would imagine Johnny you look very shocked he does, hearing that. He does. <laughs> <laughs> no because the catcher they don't know what you look like that's the yeah, worst but, position but you, nobody knows yeah, what you look I mean, like. I anyway, butt watchers of America like seven years in a row so I mean you know that's all they could ever see anyway he's oh. correct he's like no 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 they found out who I was <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know. like how do you how do you maintain 
focus on the game. You know what I mean? Like, no, it's, that's inbred. That's something that's born within you. But, so uh, but the same time, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, we've had him fixed, so he should be all right by now. If you want to go out and with him, but when you play with a level of what I played with, with Pete, Joe, Tony, we had George Foster, we had Cesar oh, Girona, with Dave Concepcion, Ken Griffey. I mean, when you play with like that. There wasn't anybody that was really much better than anybody else. We were all equals, as it turned out, because we were such a unit that we always wanted somebody else to pick it up, and we knew they would, and that was why we were so successful and won the back-to-back World Series. So somebody could afford to have a long night every now and then. We, You know, the thing about us is Sparky one day, and when he was first managing, he called us in and he said, all right, the U25 are going to the, to the north. You're going. To, you've made the team. And there's, there's two sets of rules. Pete, Joe, Tony, Johnny. You don't have rules. The rest of you guys are over there. <laughs> and I'm thinking, all right, I would like this good. And then I thought, then I realized what this is. And then he said, you know, I don't have to worry about those four guys because they know what it takes and knows what it means. So I don't think. And and I I remember my first manager, Dave Bristol, said, son, if there's there's nothing out there after 12:30 that's worth taking home. <laughs> and all it is wow. is problems, and you're not going to get your rest. When I was 18 years old, a guy named Lenny Moore comes, came over to me, son, you're going to have a great career. There's three things you have to do in moderation. You have to be, you know, not drink so much. You can't, you got to get your sleep, and you got to watch the women. Now, did you take that advice, I or did. did you do trial by error? I did. I okay. did. I, the women were, you know, I had a, I had That's the that. hardest one, I right? had a weakness, yes. Yeah, I of course. Had a, I had a weakness Good about for you. that and everything else. You ever had more than one at once? I, uh, That's a yes, me too. Drink, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the hardest one to say no to, because yeah. you're a guy, and as a young guy playing at that level, it's kind of hard to say no. Yeah. For and us. He, I, yeah, and and <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. No, it's a good time. And I you mean, got you're your... a cute guy. You know, <laughs> you got small hands. So. <laughs> <laughs> I would be no threat, believe me. I would cause no injury. <laughs> Speaking of, uh, uh, you know, we're, you're you're talking about the the app, the the Smithfield School app, and and cyberbullying and the way people behave on social media. Kurt Schilling seems to have taken the direct opposite route that you have, where you're seeing this, like, Kurt Schilling goes on social media all the time and says the nastiest stuff you could think of. Like, when you see that, what goes through your head? Well, you know, I was with Kurt not too long ago. We did a thing at the Field of Dreams out in Iowa where they shot the movie and we walked through the cornfield and everything else. I think I think a lot of people get upset with a lot of things that are going on, and sometimes they really do want to voice an opinion. Mm-hmm. I mean, they get so angry, and, and Kurt's not afraid to do this. For Kurt, Kurt just wants to stand up and th- for things that he believes in. Whether he believes in everything that everybody else agrees with, that doesn't matter to him. He's his own man. You guys have a show because you see things and you talk about them, and you have your own slant or angle and everything else, and you can voice them aloud. But, you know, Kurt has been brought fired two or three times because yeah. of things he said and and you know and it doesn't bother him it doesn't bother him at all he's very secure in who he is he's very secure in who what he believes and because somebody else doesn't believe the same thing you know we see that throughout our country now and just kurt is absolutely says you know he's uh he's going to make it his way and if somebody's got a problem with it tough that's the way he is so you respect the fact that anyone's speaking their mind and just being true to who they are. If if you know, we're I, I hate hateful, I hate hurtful, and that's part of what this app is all about. Hurtful things that that create people. I mean, you know, when people come back on Twitter and something and say something because you've done something and it's very spiteful. I mean, that's kind of a bullying attitude when when you're making things happen within a, a realm of of. Their issues are not my issues. I say, okay, I'm, I'm voting for Trump. Well, well, you can't do it. I mean, it's like, so all of a sudden, you're this. And and you want change, or you want something and everything and all. So you're this. You you know, if you're a Democrat, you're, you're a Democrat. If you're a Republican, you're 18 different types of things. Right. Uh, you know, it's you're the conservative, ultra-conservative, or this side, or that side, and everything else. I just want to change. I want to see things happen within this country that are different. I want to see where we can run this country as a business and maybe protect ourselves and be aware of the fact that we've got a lot of problems that we need to face. I, I always wonder about this. So you have this great team, right? Yep. And you're and you're building it and you're building it and you're building it and you're building it and then you hit the World Series and you hit twice, right? Yeah, and then free agent comes along. Free agency comes along, Gullet goes to to the Yankees. Uh huh. And then, was Don Gullet the first one to go? Yeah. And then, then all of a sudden it became now you're old. 
You're 34, 35. You're thir- you know, Pete's 34, 35. Tony's 34, 35. Morgan's 34, 35. And you also have kids in the minor leagues that are really talented kids, and now you've got to play them. Right. So now you got to make a space for them. So Tony Perez gets traded. I cry. Mm-hmm. Tony did you Perez, cry when he got traded? I did. I, you know, and I'll admit to it any time. It's the only person. He was the greatest, greatest uh, teammate, greatest, you know, uh, hitter in, in the clutch. He was everything, and he was my friend, and we we shared so many of these things together. So all of a sudden, they didn't realize that Tony was really the glue of our ball club, what kept everything together and kept everybody stable. And and it was just sort of like you started to see the beginning of the end. How did you find out he was traded? Uh, I My attorney called me because he was representing Tony as well, and he called me, and it just was like, no, it cannot be true. It cannot be true. And it was just a very difficult, difficult time for me. I mean, it was a, it was never going to be the same because there, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I, I always felt that we were a lot, very successful because we had white leadership, we had black leadership, and we had Latin leadership, you know. And Tony led that, and Joe led that, and Pete and I led that, and we sort of controlled the clubhouse and everything else. More importantly, the Latins that we had, uh, it, these guys, this was Tony, the father. You know, everything that they did, he would talk to them about and say, you know, you know, you know, can do that. You not you, you don't know can do that. And he, he would basically just say, that's not what we are here. We are a team. This is the way you represent yourself as a major league player. This is the ways you, you always come to the park every day. You're on time and you do your job. And you and you play for us, and we play together. Who'd they get for him? Sorry, did they get a Latin Woody, player? Woody Fryman. Was he good or left-handed no? Left-handed pitcher from out of Montreal, and good stuff, great stuff. He was from Kentucky, and but it it didn't. We needed pitching, but at the same time, uh, Dan Dreesen needed to play first base, and so that was part of the reason. And it, and it makes sense in a lot of ways, but it made no sense to any of us that were close to the game. Did you resent the guy they brought on? No, 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 no. Okay. It's, anybody was there was was there. If they came over, Sparky would all a lot of times call us in the office and say, "Hey, Pete, Joe, Tony, myself." He would say, "What do you think if we got old Bill?" No. What about Jack? Jack would be great. Or we could actually go in and say, "You know, we like to get Jim." Well, he's we'll try. You know, because we knew these guys would fit into our ball club, and it wasn't necessarily they were starting, but the fact that they were great backups. And they could do the job as well. Were there any that you almost got that you said, nah, maybe we shouldn't? And then you're like, oh, God, why did we not get him? Was there any that you overlooked that you're like, that was a terrible mistake? Uh, that I, I, I don't know. I wasn't privy to the front office. They didn't really share to it. But there was a couple of guys that came over to our club, and it was like, how did they get here? Oh. And it took about three weeks, and they, they weren't there anymore. Oh, okay. You know, Would you guys complain? And go, like, this guy's terrible. Well, he, he was a... There was a couple of guys that were pranksters. All of a sudden, it was the hot foot and the bubble gum and all this stuff. And, you know, it's high school, junior high school stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's, uh, that's not what this is about. This is not what the Big Red Machine's about. This is not the way we play. Right. We're out there to dedicate ourselves, be on time, play the game, and we don't need your sorry ass, you know, in there doing tricks and everything else and running around the clubhouse. Yeah, Pete Rose doesn't seem like a hot foot kind of guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he, he was the most dedicated guy I've ever seen. He wanted to be the first $100,000 singles hitter. He was driven. He was motivated. We were in business together. We did bowling alleys, car dealerships. And but he was always he he would say you know you can hit three hundred I said I don't care if I hit three hundred I know I can hit three hundred but I'd rather drive you in a hundred right. times each year it never drove you crazy that he was obviously focused while he was focused on the team he was also focused on his singular goals of wanting to be that no no, no we who, all did no we were all so alike. you were okay you know I I did I had first I was doing head first slides in high school but when I came up to Reds I didn't do any head first slides mm-hmm. because that was his mantra and so no everything about it made us better. Right, his drive to get 200 hits and get 100 walks and be on base 300 times for Tony, Joe, myself, it only made us better. I mean, it, we were we were perfect when it, when he because he was there. But you never really partied with Pete Rose. Oh yeah, you did. Sure, did. okay, good. Yeah, we all partied. We, you know, in the early days, if you went to a, a certain restaurant or bar after the game was over, you could take a team picture. We hung out together. You did. That's great. We really liked each other. And we certainly didn't have enough money in those days to fly anybody in. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure you're sick of talking about the Hall of Fame, but do you think, just in a general thing, do you think Pete has been treated uh, right because he made mistakes, or do you think he's been treated totally unfairly? No, he's been treated just the way baseball is said. You know, if you do this, this is what happens. You know, you, you, you have a set of rules. I tell kid, people, you go home, you tell your kids there's no more rules. Now there's right. there lies the situation. But 
I, I've, I've been on a couple of different uh, committees to get him back into the Hall of Fame, and he, he had certain parameters. He had to do this, this, and this. He's reapplied himself, but he wasn't able to sustain it. So, uh, it's you know, I've always wanted him just to go in and get, get help, you know. Sure. Go in and find out, you know, you got a problem and come out and realize uh, I mean, there's no, you know, nobody's loved the game more. Nobody's dedicated themselves more than Pete. And, yeah, uh, yeah. do you still keep in touch with all those guys? Or yeah. No? yeah, as much as I can. Joe, uh, I'm really looking, you know, I'm watching Joe very carefully. He's uh, having a bone marrow transplant uh, this month. Uh. And, uh, you know, we're all pulling for him. And, uh, Tony, I, uh, you know, I, I text him the other day because of the loss of Jose Fernandez and I met the kid down in spring training terrific kid terrific talent the, the uh, he's a pitcher right yeah he's he's the boating accident, the boating okay, accident. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's just a great kid and what him what he meant to the game and the community but Tony you know he was had a close tie with him Tony introduced me when we went down to spring training so you know to stay in touch with him and, and then Pete the other day we, we were talking about some things and and we text back and forth and then every now you know being who we are in the 40 year reunions of winning the World Series, and we get we have certain reunions. And Pete was back for his his uh, induction into the Reds Hall of Fame, and so we were all back together. And it was all like walking right back into the clubhouse. I mean, it didn't phase anybody a bit. They started just on the same things, started talking about the same things, and uh, you know, it gets kind of you get a little nervous because guys now are, you know, Pete's 75, Joe's 74, Tony's 73 or four, and you start wondering. You know, we're going to have another reunion in five sure. years. Are, yeah. we, are we all going to yeah. to be there? It it meant so much to so many baseball fans, and and it was cool just to be a part of it. Did you ever? You never managed a team? No, no I I would have, that'd been like working. Oh, you never wanted to take you know, your, your. You know, my son back here is uh, when he was nine or ten. I thought about managing. You know, so I could have him around. The, we were going through the, the you know child custody and all that stuff. I would like to have him to been at the park and been a part of it more, but it just never came to fruition. And, so, what yeah. did you do right after you left baseball? Like from because you, you said you made I mean, two million dollars is still all you did right after broadcasting. Yeah, I had okay. the, I had, well, we had the baseball bunch, and then we did uh, games people play. Uh, I had a show earlier uh, in in the early seventies, but. I did a lot of radio, uh, CBS radio. I did the World Series with Vin Scully, you know, and just uh, he's finished up a tremendous career. And I've always been a motivational speaker, so I've always gone around the country. And um, I, I'm, anything that you need done, I can do. And then I, I got more into what we're doing now and um, and also a, a self-chilling can. I know uh, we've got a can now that you uh, actually push the twist it now. It's a new twist bottom, and it goes from 80 to 40 in 50 seconds. So you I had just, one that was self-heating. I promote. <laughs> That's true. That's I did, right. I, honestly, it, it was good for like uh, in the thing, yeah, for soup and for yeah. hot beverages in the winter. And wow, it's weird. These little things. And I didn't know there was a self. We, we had to get together and just make it like a little thing. <laughs> hot and cold. <laughs> I'll just fucking hotel ride, Johnny. <laughs> well, listen, you guys can get uh, all the info you need uh, about Smithfield School app. You can go to johnnybench.com. You can go to at Johnny underscore bench five on Twitter. Uh, and the Smithfield School app. Dot com. The yeah, it's a really good thing, you know, it's yeah. because it, it is depressing that fucking, you know, teenagers are just fucking killing themselves over this shit. Yeah, yeah, it's not the happiest thing in the world. No, so. just, we didn't no. have to deal with that growing up. We had other stuff, but, you know, it wasn't constant. Right. But it's going to be a great app for, you know, school closures. I mean, you got a problem. Right. You know, you don't have to do it. You can report. You can get all, you know, you're saying, well, you got today. What's, when's your test coming up? So I don't know that. And right. then the next thing you go in, you open up the app and they say, oh, see, like your testing schedule by here. You got one on Wednesday. Let's get studying. Right. So it, it keeps the parents aware and alert. And it keeps you just you lost every teenager right. that might no. want that app. <laughs> no more lying kids. <laughs> oh, thank God. Thank God. Dad will know when the test is coming. No, no one, they no. canceled it. Yeah. We don't have it today. Oh, oh really? No, Dad. I yeah. Don't, know. don't mention that when you're trying to sell that to young people just yeah, keep the fucking yeah 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 <laughs>